we can't go to Walgreens to, to get batteries for grandma's hearing aid because it's the Sabbath. Well, that's rather yeah. manic. But on the other hand, if Sunday is just get ready for Monday day, that's a, a great loss too. You actually have to just block out that day, first of all. This day is untouchable. And so you tell the work of the week. You got right. six days. But here's the thing that happens. You start having to reassess what's a priority, what's important. Uh, praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McKig of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us from the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. As always, let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, through the intercession of St. Ignatius Loyola, we ask that you pour forth your Holy Spirit upon us, a spirit of discernment, that might hear your voice and obey your command. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, friends, I have a wish list of guests I'd like to have on the show. And this guest that we have that I'm meeting today for the first time uh, has been on my wish list for a while. She is Thomas W. Smith Fellow at the Manhattan Institute, a contributing editor of City Journal, and author of the best-selling book, Delusion, How Race and Gender Pandering Corrupt the University and Undermine Our Culture. Heather McDonald, welcome to The Catholic Current. Well, thank you so much for having me on, Father. I, I greatly appreciate it. My book is The Diversity Delusion, not just the delusion would be an even bigger topic, but this is The Diversity <laughs> Delusion. <laughs> well, I'll do that I, next I, one. I, I want to start as a point of departure, your recent articles that are provocatively titled, you talk about classical music's suicide pact. That's an arresting title. What are you trying to communicate there? Well, that classical music uh, is committing suicide. The profession is committing suicide like many other great institutions of Western civilization by succumbing to the false narrative that it is racist. Uh, which is simply pr a preposterous claim, uh, but you have the classical music press, classical academics, musicians, singers, uh, composers, all now jumping on the highly lucrative, highly politically uh, 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 sort of positive and, 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 and power-bringing idea that this is a tradition that is racist and that is currently, as a profession, is racist. And, and that is a suicide pact because when we inject the poison of identity politics into any institution, when we teach its participants or those who may be contemplating entry into that institution, whether it's a university or the study of literature, the study of art, the study of music, that its most important characteristics are racism and sexism, and we teach potential acolytes to see everything through the trivializing lens of, of race and sex. Uh, we, are, we are poisoning that institution, making it a pariah, and making sure that nobody will want to be a member of it in the future. I remember reading a music critic who described the, the music of Johann Sebastian Bach as the sound of God thinking. Now, as a professor of philosophy and theology, I found that compelling, and it moved me to spend more time and energy attending to the music of Bach. But if I'm a young person who hears that uh, your great classical Western music is too white and too male and structurally racist, etc., aren't I going to be inclined to say, well, well then why bother? Why get a subscription to the Met? Why buy CDs? Why tune into certain channels on Spotify? If it's all corrupt and beyond re redemption, I mean, it seems to me that the, the music industry is poisoning the, its own well. I, is that a correct apprehension? Yes, it's, it's utterly stunning. We are, across the board, we're giving young people a justification for their own ignorance. Young people today, there's virtually nothing between their ears besides Instagram accounts and the desperate search for likes. They know nothing about literature, art, or music. And classical music in particular is a art form of, I would say, the greatest sublimity and pathos and, and uh, revelation about what the human spirit contains. It, it, it is shrinking in salience by the year uh, because it has been so marginalized by youth culture, by pop culture. And, and when you 
tell students to think of it in terms of, oh, this is just one huge thing that is white, which is such a, a, a preposterous reduction of the variety and complexity of this tradition, you're justifying they're not knowing anything about it. As you say, there's our culture now views the greatest uh, crime that one could ever commit, the greatest moral sin, to be alleged racism. And so why would any young person want to associate himself with a tradition that is being characterized this way? And, and what is most stunning to me is the classical music press, the leaders within that, like Alex Ross, who's the classical music critic of The New Yorker, or Anthony Tomasini, who's the lead classical music critic of The New York Times, the Washington Post classical music critics, have all jumped on this racism bandwagon. They know the challenge of getting audiences into concert halls. They know the shrinking of the subscription audience, the aging of the audience. And yet they would rather put their own uh, left-wing credentials ahead of what should be their commitment to this greatest of all art forms. Friends, I'm speaking with Heather McDonald of Manhattan Institute and City Journal, author of the best-selling book, The Diversity Delusion. Heather, I want to draw an, an analogy to, to, to painting and sculpture. I, I lived in London for a few years, and I went to a museum that had kind of an old wing and a new wing. And you go to the old wing, and you had painters and sculptors who were steeped in the Greco-Roman classics uh, as well as uh, sacred scripture. And so they had brilliant themes of, of aspiration and failure and, and hope and despair and titanic struggle. And then you go to the modern section and there's an inverted video of someone on a pogo stick. Is something similar happening to music that we're cutting ourselves off from the greatest aspirations and struggles of the human soul once expressed in music? And instead, we're just looking at a, a spoils system. Am, am, I, am I reading that correctly? Well, I completely agree with your observations. I think they're somewhat different. What we see in the visual arts today is the disappearance of craft. Uh, you know, it used to be that the basis of art was hand-eye coordination. You learned first how to draw. And that was your, your mechanism into the world of the visual arts. And, and there was an, a due appreciation for tradition, even... We think of, we now love to lionize, to say, the Impressionist for breaking with the academic uh, tradition of, of the, of the Beaux-Arts and the French, you know, uh, conservatory schools. But they studied the masters with as much reverence as any of the Beaux-Arts, Bougereau, or, or other of their contemporaries. And... They learned how to see, and they learned how to draw. Today's art schools have none of that craft. You're absolutely right. You, you describe the videos. You describe the installations. These, you cannot tell a good installation from bad installation. An installation is, you know, you walk into a room, and it's filled with used tampons and a bunch of string, some, uh, you know, deflated balloons or something. And that is supposed to be a feminist statement. Uh, you can't tell if that's well, a well-done installation versus a less well-done installation. Anybody can do it. It is, it is the attack on expertise and the attack on, on accomplishment. What's happening in music, as far as what's being created in contemporary music now, is uh, something that's it's different, you know, there probably is much less emphasis on learning counterpoint and the, the type of, of, of musical structures that Bach and Haydn and Mozart uh, worked with and, and Beethoven, uh, but it, it is in some respects highly academic. I mean, atonal music was, was very intellectual. It, it had a, its own type of craft. So I would distinguish what you're rightly observing with the decline of the visual arts from the racial attack on on the classical canon. Heather, I'm I'm a, a Jesuit, and we have a noble tradition of missionary work. And in Latin America in the 16th century, uh, we distinguish ourselves by going into the remote areas of Amazon and teaching people who had no contact with European cultures how to how to build great basilicas, how to make symphonic instruments, and how to incorporate their own musical traditions into the great symphony traditions of the West. And there was something so universal 
about music as an expression of, of, of the human spirit and the order of creation that folks who you would think would be least likely to be receptive to that music uh, became masters of it themselves. Uh, on your view, uh, that can't fit into the narrative, can it? No, and it, it also doesn't fit into the narrative, you know, that this is this white supremacist tradition that for most of the 20th century, the, the leaders in, among soloists and conductors were Jews. You know, these were not necessarily people that were embraced for, for much of the European tradition, you know, until we became more Enlightenment-inspired. Uh, Christians and Jews did not view themselves under one uh, umbrella of Judeo-Christianity. It was quite the contrary. And now we have Asians who were dominant. The, the Asian parents, especially in Chinese, they are absolutely hungry to have their children learn Bach, learn Beethoven, uh, learn violin and piano. Uh, and it is a universal tradition. The, the great pianist Long Long, uh, who is now... Heather, we're coming you know, up on a break. We can take up the thread of the conversation in the next segment. Friends, we come back. We're going to continue our conversation regarding classical music suicide pact. My distinguished guest today is Heather McDonald. Remember, our rallying cry here at the Catholic Current is Christus Mundo Mundus Christo, bringing Christ to the world and the world to Christ. We do it because our Lord says so for the greater glory of God, the love of our neighbor, and the salvation of our own soul. After the broadcast today, go to the station of the cross.com, get our resources list, download our audio as podcast. Let's take this conversation to the whole world. We'll be back in just two minutes. Stay with us. The universe is filled with order from top to bottom. It's a beautiful order, and not only is it beautiful, it's order that we can actually comprehend. And it's almost as if we have been made to be able to comprehend that order in the universe, to be able to contemplate it so that we can see maybe that purpose behind it. Please visit Father Spitzer's website, magiscenter.com, to watch this beautiful and important video about purpose in God's creation. That's M-A-G-I-S center.com. You're listening to The Catholic Current with Father Robert Mateig from the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. Stay connected with the show, our guests, and topics by following the show on Twitter and Gab. Just search for The Catholic Current. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTagg of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for The Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us from the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. We're talking about classical music suicide pact. My distinguished guest is Heather McDonald of the Manhattan Institute and City Journal, author of the important book called The Diversity Delusion. Heather, at the end of the last segment, you were talking about how uh, Asian Asian parents, especially Chinese parents, uh, even in mainland communist China, are interested in having their children uh, learn and master the Western musical canon. What do you make of that? Well, I was I was starting to say, Father, that uh, uh, Long Long, one of the great pianists contemporary uh, today and a great philanthropist, was uh, hounded, driven by his father to... Uh, succeed in, in, in classical piano, and they were obsessed with winning competitions, uh, and a uh, focus that uh, he had to be sort of pulled away from, kicking and screaming once he got to the Curtis Institute. Um, the, you know, said it's not all just about being number one, but making music. But in any case, at some point, Long Long had done very well in China, but then was going to enter his first European piano competition in Germany, and he was very worried, and he said to his father, uh, you know, how can I possibly compete? This is their music. And his father told him, it's your music. It's everybody's music. This is a universal music. Uh, you have as much right to play it as anybody else. And that is absolutely correct. Uh, it is, a, it is a, a, an idiom of amazing complexity that has drawn people in uh, across the board, I you know the more I think about this whole sick and 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 hateful and destructive attack, the more I just am stunned by the the gall of trying to reduce it all to whiteness. 
I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous. It's, whiteness is the least relevant of its characteristics because every composer has a different voice and there are so many different national traditions and, and interplay between it. I mean, it, it is just amazingly reductive and you are, you are, you are preventing young people from having any hope of expanding their knowledge of what it is to be human by entering a world of, of such beauty and, and greatness. And it's a, it's a tragedy both for young people, but it's also a tragedy for the music itself because we have an obligation to keep these great works alive, whether it's right. literature or art or music. And when we stop performing them or reading them, they basically die or at least go into some sort of limbo purgatory uh, waiting for to be reawakened, but but they are not given the salience that they deserve. Heather, the last university I taught at had a, had a rather serious uh, music program, uh, both choral and instrumental. And I would go to the senior recitals to listen to my students perform. And I'm certainly no expert in classical music at all. And I would sit there and say, well, that's nice. But I would watch the director of the program listening to to the music and every now and again he he would twitch as if something were discordant to him and I, and I knew that he was hearing things and understanding things that I was just not trained to perceive and I, I, I lamented my own ignorance and I envied these young people who were entering into such a, a, a grand and beautiful and powerful world. It seems to me that if we follow the, the path of looking at this music only through the prism of race, that big beautiful world is going to be closed off to most people. Am I reading that correctly? Yeah. Uh, and yes, you're absolutely right. The more you know about anything, the, the more one's understanding. And everybody should be encouraged to listen to classical music without prior knowledge and just feel the sonic experience of being in a, in a concert hall and having a full symphony orchestra sending out its massive sound into your sternum uh, and and working through classical development, it's an extraordinary thing. But I have to say that the more you know, the more you're able to distinguish and can tell, okay, this is clearly a Baroque work, this is a, a work from the classical period or the Romantic period or post-Romantic, and then start to distinguish between composers, Schubert and Schumann, and, and periods, you know, early bit. The more one is amazed at, at what is there. Uh, so, yes, start, you know, do not feel like you need knowledge to start. It, right. it, it should be primarily initially a, a visceral aesthetic experience, but uh, this is something that rewards deeper and deeper learning. And the more you know about this tradition, the, the more extraordinary it will seem. Heather, I want to go back to something you said in the last segment when I talked about the visual arts and that loss of commitment to, to craft. And I, I've seen that in a variety of, of academic endeavors as well. But it has been suggested that one of the reasons why classical music is um, is running into hard times is because you, you really can't fake excellence. You, you either do it or you don't. You either have it or you don't. And a part of the spillover of you know what you call the diversity delusion is that somehow merit, the word merit or achievement, are intrinsically uh, racist and, and, and oppressive. Do people actually believe that or is that just or is that just a way of manipulating to, to, to get a, a, to get on the payroll as, as the diversity director? That's hard to say. I my inclination is to take people at their word and think that they actually do believe it. Uh, I think that there's people who've been so immersed in this hatred of a civilization deemed too white and too male that they are they think at least that they really do think that colorblind standards of achievement of scientific knowledge of reading knowledge of math knowledge of of technical knowledge in the arts or engineering or physics that all those things are simply uh, power plays, you know, that they're just excuses for, for maintaining power in some sort of Foucaultian way. Uh, and, and the thing that is driving the great takedown of our culture today is the fact that every meritocratic colorblind standard 
does have a disparate impact overwhelmingly on blacks. That is the sad truth. It is the sad secret. If, if, if disparate impact did not exist, we would not be having these, con these, these phony narratives about everything being racist. But the fact of the matter is, the black academic achievement gap is so vast, you have about 54% of black eighth graders who do not even have partial mastery of, of, of uh, eighth grade math skills. They are below basic, which is defined as mere partial mastery. So they, they're, they're not even on the charts of, of knowing anything about math. Nearly as high a percentage of eight, black eighth graders do not have reading skills that are even partial mastery of what they should be in the eighth grade. And those gaps never change. The average 12th grader who's black reads the level of the average eighth grader who is white. That means that any kind of academic standard that is colorblind, this is why we're getting rid of the SAT and the, and the uh, Midwestern exams, which I can never remember them because I took the SATs, but, but the alternative to the SAT, the ACT, schools are junking all of them for the one reason, the only reason they're doing it is because they have a disparate impact on blacks. And, and that's true in, in music. I mean, we have a, the, the, the thing that's so audacious about the racism claim when it comes to classical music and orchestras is that orchestras audition new orchestral members behind a screen. Mm -hmm. So the audition committee that's choosing the musician doesn't know who that person is, doesn't know his race, doesn't know his sex. It's, it's a purely meritocratic system, but because it does not yield 12% black string players in the New York Philharmonic, we've decided that colorblind auditions are racist. I mean, it's a contradiction in terms. It's a, it's a logical impossibility, uh, but that is the truth. And, and the reason that there is a disproportion of Asians and an underproportion of blacks is not because the system is racist or the, mer the standards for choosing musicians are racist. It's because there's a culture of classical music in the Asian home that doesn't exist in the black home and, and exists less than the Asians in the white homes. I mean, it, Jews are being pushed aside by Asians because they're out practicing everybody at this point. And, and that's what's going to get you into the New York Philharmonic. The, the level of competition is simply beyond belief. Right. Uh, you know, the, the salience of, of classical music may have, have waned, but it, ironically, our level of performance is higher than it has ever been in human history. Uh, the 19th century composer, the French composer Hector Berlioz, toured Europe uh, in the mid-19th mid century performing his works, and he despaired at the mediocrity that he encountered in much of, of Europe's orchestras, with the exception of Germany. He would be utterly in heaven if he could, if he could have, you know, the Symphonie Fantastique or, or, or his opera Les Troyennes performed by today's ensembles, which are virtually flawless in their, in their performances. I want to draw an analogy to an article I read by George Will many years ago, where he, he, he talked about a certain ethnic group in the Middle East where parents were giving their children literature about how to strap dynamite vests on each other, whereas parents in mainland China were the, one of the best-selling books was called How to Get Your Kid into Harvard. And he said cultures that publish books like that eventually develop their own Harvard. It isn't part of the issue which no one wants to talk about in polite society is if you don't have intact families that value learning and excellence in the transmission of culture, then you're not going to have learning and excellence in, in the transmission of, uh, uh, of culture. Is that one of the forbidden topics? Absolutely. I mean, there's no bigger social catastrophe in the United States today than the breakdown of the family. It's, it's unique. There's nothing comparable in Europe. There's certainly nothing comparable in Asia. And uh, that's why you have the black crime rates that we have. You know, the, a black Chicagoan is 80 times more likely to commit a shooting than a white Chicagoan. A, a black New Yorker is, is 50 times more likely to commit a drive-by shooting than a white New Yorker. These kids are going around, especially now in the post-George Floyd riot era, engaging in utterly barbaric, utterly senseless retaliatory shootings, just spraying gunfire 
recklessly, madly across sidewalks, not caring who they hit. They're taking down one-year-olds, nine-month-olds, three-year-olds in their beds, in their backyards, at barbecues. Uh, and it's all because they're growing up in a culture without marriage. Not only do they not have fathers themselves, but they, they do not have a marriage norm that civilizes young males. And so the consequences of this go far beyond the lack of, of classical music training in the home or even the lack of, of emphasis on education. It's, it's about basic ability to socialize young men, and too many young black boys are not being socialized, and that's, that's what's behind the crime drive. But it is also, I, I would say that with regards to educational accomplishment, it's, yes, it's family breakdown, but it is also the, the lack of a, of a Heather, priority. we're coming up on, on a break, but we can take up the thread in the next uh, segment. Friends, we come back. We're going to continue our conversation with my distinguished guest, Heather McDonald of the Manhattan Institute and City Journal. We're talking about Classical Music's Suicide Pact. In the next segment, we're going to talk about remedies and responses and why most of them seem to be not a very good idea. After the broadcast today, go to the thestationofthecross.com, get our audio, follow us on your favorite platform. We'll be right back. Stay with us. This is the Catholic Current from the Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network. Catch up on an episode you've missed or share them with your family or friends. The Catholic Current is podcasted wherever you enjoy listening. Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and the iCatholic Radio mobile app. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us from the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. Talking about classical music suicide pack, my distinguished guest is Heather McDonald of the Manhattan Institute and the City Journal. Heather, at the end of the last segment, I think what we were talking about we've seen a fact that there is a not proportional representation of of blacks in in the western music industry for lack of a better term and the remedy seems to be denying the symptoms rather than 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 looking at roots and and your research in other areas has shown that the real roots is is the collapse of the family and no one wants to to talk about that why, why is that why not? Well, I think generally we don't want to talk about the traditional family because feminists uh, control the discourse and they believe that we have to proclaim endlessly that strong women can do it all. Males are being marginalized, they're being demonized, they're being described as toxic. And so we have an increasingly feminized culture uh, that that is uh, has, feels animus towards traditional male virtues of of courage, of, of risk-taking, of, of entrepreneurship, of conquest, of drive. And, and so that's a, 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 tr- a truth generally. I, I also think that the elites turn their eyes away from black dysfunction because they're terrified that the black, white, and black, Asian achievement gap and, and behavior gap is never going to close. And they're terrified about pot- potential explanations for that that don't accord with woke ideology, and so they're determined to proleptically insist that only racism is the is the allowable explanation for that. But, you know, I, I would say, again, it's not just when it comes to academic achievement, it's not just the breakdown of the family, although that's part of it. It's also the anti-acting white ideology that that penalizes black students that want to study and learn as as acting white as aping white values and so you have a a norm that that valorizes dropping out of school and and not paying attention to your teacher not not going to school not doing your homework and the peer pressure to not study is very huge 
And when someone uh, achieves, uh, a, you know, in the, in the face of that narrative, uh, it, I think it begins to break down the power of that narrative. You, you recently published an article in City Journal about conductor and violinist John McLaughlin Williams. I'm looking at a photograph of him right now. Arguably, he can't be described as, as a white su supremacist. He has some very challenging things to say about the racialization of classical music. Can you fill us in on that, please? Oh, he's just wonderful. It was one of my greatest privileges in writing this article to have met him. I, I just am astounded by his insight. And he, his family represents what has been called the, the talented tenth. This was a term that W.D. Du Bois popularized, though he didn't originate, which refers to the that segment of the of of the black population that that fervently embraces bourgeois values that emphasizes education. His his grandfather you know, came back, or great-grandfather came back from World War I, severely wounded with an eighth-grade education and went on to earn a Ph.D. in, in agricultural economics and be a dean of a uh, agricultural and technical school in the South. McLaughlin Williams' parents met as, ho at, as piano students at Howard University and, and had classical music in the home at all times. They played Chopin and Bach and Beethoven sonatas. They also played black uh, composers like William Grant Still and and Scott Joplin, uh, and and their view was it, whether it's great. If it's great, the race doesn't matter, you know. And and McLaughlin Williams said, greatness is for everybody. It's why I have why we have vaccines and why I have a car. And he's completely contemptuous of the effort to racialize classical music. And he said, if we have, you know, if we're going to de-blind auditions, that is, if we're going to take the screen down so that the uh, judges can give preference to black violinists over more competitive white and Asian violinists. Why have auditions at all? Why not just send in a headshot? Which right. is absolutely right. Uh, and and he has come under pressure uh, for his politics, for his belief in colorblindness, for his belief in conservative values. Uh, but he's been a, a, a real courageous source within music because he's also leaving aside anything racial he's done something which very few com conductors do which is to go out and find very obscure uh composers who have fallen into oblivion that he he believes deserve to be reheard again and he's had brought out a particular group of early 20th century american composers well he represents the universalist ideal of classical music because you have a black conductor conducting the National Symphony of Ukraine in white male composers from the early 20th century uh, and, and doing this with, you know, a certain degree of popular commercial success. Uh, so he's the antidote and uh, speaks with such amazing enthusiasm and love about his musical passions. So you, you meet somebody like that and you think, well, if we can somehow figure out how to clone him, there's no necessary <laughs> inevitability of despair, but it's it's still an uphill battle. It certainly is. Friends, my distinguished guest today is Heather McDonald of the Manhattan Institute and City Journal, author of the very important book called The Diversity Delusion. We're talking about the, the suicide of classical music. W one of the things I, I enjoyed in, in reading your, your study of, uh, of Mr. Williams is that it shows that wh who he is is not impossible. I mean, according to the racial theorists, John McLaughlin Williams simply cannot exist. And yet here he is. Uh, he's a real life breathing person uh, of a really distinguished uh, accomplishment and someone who's making contributions to human culture. I, I find that inspiring. Can you speculate why would some people find John McLaughlin Williams to be threatening? Because he threatens the uh, the claim that every black to be black is to be oppressed, and that is a highly lucrative claim. It means that there's now an entire specialty in being black. Uh, you know that that's now a gig. You you're black, and that's your accomplishment. It means you get hired as a diversity consultant to tell institutions that they're racist, or you get hired as a literature professor to talk about blackness and your oppression and to teach students to think of themselves as oppressors or as, or as oppressed, uh, because it's something that nobody can compete with you on. You know, nobody else 
who's not black can be black. And, it, you know, females do the same thing. They make being female an accomplishment in itself. It is not. It's not even particularly interesting. But nobody can take that away from me. Males cannot compete with me on that ground. Williams is saying, I want none of that. I want to be judged as a human being. Uh, but, but, but that sort of thing threatens the race gig. And, you know, ironically, well, Williams, I just have to say this about the classical music field as well. The idea that it's racist, orchestras have been, since the 1960s, have been bending over backwards to try and inspire and incentivize black kids to go into classical music forever. They've had programs in schools, they've had fellowships, they've had uh, tutoring and, and taking auditions, you know, composers and residents who are black. The field has been trying for decades to diversify, and yet the field calls itself racist at this point. McLaughlin Williams was himself the beneficiary of that, grateful beneficiary. There's adorable pictures of himself he sent me playing at the Kennedy Center and, you know, being brought in as a as a black student to the St. South Carolina, uh, an orchestra down there that's trying to diversify. Uh, so, so he knows that this is not currently a racist field, although his father as a pianist, was subjected to racism, and it, it stunted his career. Williams is able to do something that few people today can do, which is say, the past was one thing, the present is not the past. His one area where he has been discriminated against is his politics. Hmm. He was a candidate for an important recording contract of a, of a recently deceased American composer. When the family... Uh, found out that he had posted some comments supportive of Trump on his Facebook page. They said, we cannot work with this man. He's a pariah. He's, he's completely an untouchable. And, and the producer of the project wrote him the most self-righteous letter saying, you know, it was hard enough when I learned that you supported Judge W. Bush, but when I learned that you supported Trump, I just can't believe it. I know nobody who would vote for Trump except maybe the local pizza delivery guy just confessing to this guy's own own bubble, political right. bubble. Uh, and, and so he, 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 he lost that, not because of his race, but because a largely white elite refused to have anything to do with somebody who had different political views than their own. Heather, I, I know in, in your articles you, you, you quoted a, a recently hired diversity, inclusion, equity, and belonging czar. And at the end of a letter where you know she was preening about getting someone fired, she said, the work is never done. I mean, it seems to me if you hire me as the associate dean of diversity and inclusion, I have absolutely no incentive in ever being satisfied, do I? I have to find more and more remote, obscure, and hidden otherwise undetectable forms of racism. In other words, if I'm not zealously uh, the witch finder general, then, then, then I'm out of work. Once, once this genie is let out of the bottle, you can't put it back in again, can you? That's right. And that's why we have microaggressions. Microaggressions are an implicit acknowledgement that racism doesn't exist. So we have to look for things that are invisible to the human eye. It becomes this miasma. So yes, we have an entire industry, many, many people, I mean, just Billions of dollars being made each year on the narrative that America is endemically white supremacist. The same thing with police consent decrees, which Joe, Joe Biden, our president, wants to reinvigorate now, putting police departments under federal control. The federal monitors who were paid, you know, $10 million over the, over the contract also have no incentive to declare that the police department is in compliance with these draconian new mandates. Uh, and so the consent decrees last for decades. Uh, so, so it is a problem. I don't know. You know, it's a structural problem when you have somebody overseeing a problem uh, whose job depends on the problem continuing, right. uh, and yet the job is ostensibly to end the problem. Well, that's not going to happen. Heather, we've got about a minute and a half left in this segment. Can we begin to talk about where we would have to go to move towards a, a real solution? Well, I think for one thing, we have to stop acknowledge. We have to stop apologizing. We have to stop capitulating. We have to stop being frightened of being called racist. We have to stand up for a tradition that is, I would argue, the greatest the world has ever known. That has brought us affluence, uh, physical health, beauty, greatness, protection from from want and from the elements. And the fact of the matter is, it is. Uh, it is overwhelmingly white, but that is simply a demographic reality. 
Europe was white. There weren't many blacks there until the 20th century. Africa was black. China was Chinese. These are demographic realities. Right now, the weapon is to call any individual or any institution white, and you've taken him down or taken that institution down. As long as we're not willing to stand up to that and say, yes, it may be white, but it's also for everybody, and it's also great, uh, we're going we're gonna to see our civilization end. Progress right. will end. So we have to stop being frightened of the charge of racism. It is in almost all instances not justified. Well, you know, I have a, a book I'm waiting, it should be coming out soon on, on, on Christendom. I'm waiting for the contract now. But I say, yes, Christendom does have European roots, but its fruits and its reach are universal because they're human. And when we express what is authentically human, we can also begin to discover something about God's wisdom and providence for us. So th- this isn't just a political battle or cultural battle for me. It, it's, a, it's a spiritual battle as well, and, and I think we have to approach it that way. Friends, we come back and we continue my conversation with my distinguished guest, Heather McDonald. We're talking about classical music's suicide. In the next segment, we're going to talk about striving to communicate beauty uh, and greatness to the next generation. Be part of the conversation. Follow what we're following by following us on Gab. That's G-A-B dot com. Our channel is The Catholic Current. Everything you need to take this conversation to your family and friends, we bring to you. Together, let's take it around the world. We can do it together. We cannot do it without you. We'll be back in just two minutes. Please do stay with us. Station of the Cross thanks our financial supporters who have enabled us to broadcast Catholic programs for more than 20 years. As a nonprofit lay organization not affiliated with your diocese, our apostolate is listener supported. Through your generosity, we're able to inspire countless listeners with the gospel message and help lead them to a parish to be spiritually nourished by the sacraments. Thank you for your continued support, and may God bless you and your family. After today's broadcast, go to the Catholic Current Show page on thestationofthecross.com for info on today's guests, the show resource links, and to sign up for our weekly email of upcoming shows. Praise be Jesus Christ. This is Father Robert McTague of the Society of Jesus, your daily host for the Catholic Current, where we bring Christ to the world and the world to Christ. You're listening to us on the Station of the Cross Studios, your local radio station and the iCatholic Radio mobile app, where we proclaim the fullness of truth with clarity and charity. We're talking about the suicide of classical music. My distinguished guest today is Heather McDonald, the Manhattan Institute, contributing editor of City Journal and author of the important bestseller, The Diversity Delusion, How Race and Gender Pandering Corrupt the University and Undermine Our Culture. Heather, I I believe that we owe a debt to the past. We need to acknowledge that we receive great gifts from our, our, our ancestors. And also we owe something to the future. The treasures that we received, we have to hand on to the next generation. It seems that commitment to transmitting and generating a culture of excellence is not only on the wane, but under attack, how do ordinary people push back against that, that, that corrosive impulse? Well, I don't know if ordinary people can do that. I mean, they can certainly, uh, because I, one problem I think Americans are not particularly invested in the, in the Western cultural tradition, let's be honest. I mean, it's mm-hmm. been a practical country, and I, I'm not sure many parents care whether their children are getting exposed to Dickens and Trollope and Mark Twain and 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 Herman Melville and Nathaniel Hawthorne uh, or George Eliot, uh, they they think in terms of practical. Uh, they want their kids to be credentialized in a in a prestigious way and to get a good job. I would hope more people would would understand that education and learning is an end in itself uh, that should not just be monetized. But if they do have a glimpse that that is something that is one should not die with, without having been exposed to the greatness of human civilization, they should 
take their kids out of the public schools for sure, uh, which are not uh, exposing children any longer to Western civilization and instead are, are devoted to a politicized education and uh, either homeschool them or search for schools that are uh, committed to a classical education. And there's may not be in, in your neighborhood, which would be sad, but I know that Hillsdale College has a, a charter school program that is creating these classical schools. Uh, but, but you're absolutely right. The great British philosopher Michael Oakeshott defined school as the place where one generation passes on an inheritance to another, and that is the essence of education. It's, it's inculcating children into an entire civilization of, of its traditions, its expectations, its norms, and its creations, and, and that's just not going on. We have, right. as I say, individuals today are skating on the very surface of things, a social media bacchanal of of trivial celebrity culture and infused with with then the 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 narcissism of identity politics so so i hope that parents can understand i you know i would start as a parent too with the with the young children with the great british children's classics that are are so filled with irony and wit and imagination whether it's wind in the willows or or the alice in wonderland stories or winnie the pooh or e nesbitt uh, the, the Wizard of Oz books, there's 13 of them, not just one. These are all great ways to start your child on the world of imagination and, and empathy. You know, I, I think of uh, John Sr. In, in his books, uh, The Death of Christian Culture and the Restoration of Christian Culture, where he lists a thousand books to read with your children between the ages of five and 18. He said, if you don't cultivate their moral imagination, if you don't cultivate their uh, their empathy, and it doesn't happen by accident, uh, then they're not going to be able to read appreciatively. They're not going to enjoy the arts. And really, they're, they're, they're not going to be moral human beings. And I know when I started teaching in 1992, there seemed to be a skill gap and a curiosity gap between the, te- the kids I was teaching 30 years ago and my own undergraduate uh, program 10 years uh, before. Eventually, yeah. I, one of the reasons I left teaching was because I got tired of interrupting my lectures with the observation, this is the part where you write down what I say. And at first, students would look at me with bewilderment, and later they would look at me with indignation. It seems to me that university life is now the place where you go to get immersed in woke culture. It's the pre-preventional certification program, and it's the late adolescent uh, cruise line party spa. My my sense is that this system is going to have to collapse. Eventually, the higher ed bubble will, 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 will burst. What do you think might be left afterwards? Oh, man, I hope so. I mean, and everybody was hoping that COVID would do it. But in fact, to my utter despair, many of the prestigious schools are stronger than ever. <laughs> their, their application rates are up. Uh, it couldn't happen too soon. I aspired to be an academic. I thought there was nothing greater in life than being the curator of these works. And then I'm so glad I didn't go into it because it would be just an, the most depressing experience. And you're absolutely right, Father. The students know nothing. They are utter ignoramuses. And and it's the failure of the schools. It's also the failure of the parents. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take them off the hook. They should be monitoring their children's uh, learning, and they should be reading to them early on. If you don't, you're you're absolute lazy bums. I'm sorry. I'm gonna say it. So what should happen right now? I think we need to recreate the grand tour. You know, parents should take out tutors for their children that if they can find any graduate students that have actually learned languages and history and literature and art. Uh, instead of identity politics, and 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 come up with alternatives and and conservative philanthropists rather than doing everything about free market this and capitalist that, which is important, of course, but they should look at starting a new institution that is devoted to humanistic learning, it, not 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 just because well American founders and blah 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 and capitalism, but because it is an end in itself. Right. It does not need to be justified on utilitarian grounds of critical thinking or better job at Goldman Sachs because you're a critical thinker. It is an end in itself to know these books, to know this music, to know this art, to know this sculpture, and your life will be poorer if you die without having known it. Yes, of course. I mean, the, the, the true, the good, and the beautiful are 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 certainly self-justifying. And you know, I, I think of a billboard I saw years ago that said, 
the graduates of other schools get degrees, our graduates get jobs. Now, I, I've been employed and unemployed. I think employed is better. But isn't one of the revelations of great classical music is that there, there's more to reality and even better to reality that's not material? Yes, absolutely. You listen to Beethoven's late piano sonatas or late quartets, you're, taking it, you're taken into a terrifying realm a realm that you, you have no idea where you are, it is strange, it's, it's lonely, it's vast, it's majestic. It is, a, it is a realm of human thought and experience that you wouldn't have known about before. And it's like entering a secret, glittering cave. And, and once you've seen that, you, your, your life is changed. So yes, these are ends in themselves. Uh, and I was very depressed when Pre President Donald Trump's education secretary, Betsy DeVos, started rating schools not just on uh, the, the value added in their salary of graduates, but particular majors in, in how much money the graduates made after majoring in them. Well, you know, it may be that studying Greek and Latin is not the most lucrative. It's not as lucrative as studying, say, the, the fluff of marketing. But so what? You know, if you've read Aeschylus in the original, if you've read Sophocles and Euripides in the original, if you can read Virgil in the original, uh, you've 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 got a better life in in many senses than those people who are now working, you know, in in some corporate office for 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 General Foods, you know, developing the latest sugary sugary uh, 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 cereal and and being woke about the diversity climate at your at your corporation. Uh, Heather McDonald, I will conclude our conversation with a, a rousing amen. I am in complete agreement. Uh, I will continue to uh, follow your work with a very great interest, and I am most grateful for your time today. Thank you, Father. I appreciate it. I'm Jesuit Father Robert McTague. You want to join us uh, for a special episode of The Catholic Current tomorrow. We mark the third anniversary of The Catholic Current with me at the helm. Don't miss out on that. After the broadcast today, go to thestationofthecross.com, get our resources list, download our audio as podcast. Everything you need to take the conversation to your family and friends, we give to you. Together we'll take it around the world. May mighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go in peace and please pray for me. Thank you for listening to this podcast brought to you by the Station of the Cross.com, a listener funded nonprofit organization. Please prayerfully consider donating at the Station of the Cross.com by calling 1 877 888 6279 or through our free iCatholic Radio mobile app.